Tigers are terrestrial mammals that belong to the genus Panthera, a classification that groups the five species of big cats. Lions, jaguars, leopards, snow leopards, and tigers. They are easily recognizable by their unique black striped pattern on a dark orange coat and because they are the largest species of the Felidae family. The tiger is the largest of the five big cats that belong to the genus Panthera. Fiery and imposing, aggressive and powerful, tigers have aroused fascination in humans through millennia, but they have also experienced threats in their natural environment as a result of human activities. The tigers have anatomy with over 600 muscles and a strong bone structure that makes them apex predators in their natural habitat. They can leap more than 30 feet in a single jump, which gives them an advantage when it comes to finding and attacking their prey. And they evolved from their ancestors for almost 2 million years, continuously adapting to their environment. All tigers are native to Asia and belong to a single species, Panthera tigris, which has six subspecies. Bengal tiger, Siberian tiger, Indochinese tiger, Malayan tiger, South China tiger, and the Sumatran tiger. Tigers are ruthless and effective hunters and lonely walkers. Around them, there is a mythology that puts these cats as a symbol of positive values, strength, fierceness, tenacity, and power. Their elegant gait, haughty demeanor, and their dynamic movements are an example of adapted anatomy for hunting. Since tigers are at the top of the food chain, they are considered super predators. Like other big cats, tigers are skilled hunters who make use of different techniques to kill other animals, mainly ungulate herbivores, which are their primary food. When detecting prey, they move very stealthily as close as possible, but at a distance to avoid being discovered. Then they slowly creep towards the prey and jump, taking it by surprise, so it has a small chance to escape. When tigers catch prey, they bite their neck between the vertebrae to break the spine and kill the animal. Although tigers are extremely efficient hunters, they don't always make the kill as you would expect them to. When they can sneak up on the prey, they only have a few seconds to pounce and kill them by biting them in the neck area. They can take down animals much larger than themselves. If you expect to see a streak of tigers, you're not going to get lucky. These cats differ from lions because they usually roam alone. They hunt, feed, and rest without the company of other tigers and lack a defined social structure. However, from time to time, they hang around with others and, evidently, they interact during mating. Tigers have a sociality classification of solitary, but social, which includes those animals that look for food alone, are territorial, but can briefly socialize or sleep in similar locations. Tigers are animals that live in South and Southeast Asia, as well as the eastern part of Russia and China. Some live in temperate climates, while others live in tropical environments. Siberian tigers live in cold climates, where it snows, their heavy fur coat and extra layer of fur on their paws protect them from the cold temperatures. Also, they have an extra layer of fur around their neck that's sometimes called a scarf. This insulates them from the cold even more. Tigers live in different habitats including swamps, grasslands, deciduous, and mangrove forests. The type of habitat each of the subspecies lives in depends on its species. Malayans live in tropical broadleaf forests while Indochinese tigers live in hilly, mountainous areas. Bengals live in rainforests, while the Sumatran live in lowland forests and around swamps. Tigers sometimes migrate short distances to find a larger supply of their prey. Also, they may migrate to an area with less snow and warmer temperatures in the cold weather months. As you can see, tigers live far from Africa, the territory of lions. This has led many animal enthusiasts to wonder what would happen if tigers lived in Africa and competed with lions for a meal. The African continent is known for its great diversity of wild flora and fauna. The diverse ecosystems of the continent are home to wildlife species found nowhere else in the world, including some of the world's deadliest animals. Tigers already survive in places like snowy mountains, desert plateaus, dense forests, humid jungles, 
open grasslands, and quite a lot in between. Even though the tiger-striped camouflage performs best in jungles and forests, the woodlands and savannas of much of Africa would not stop this adept apex predator from hunting successfully. Since most prey species do not see a full range of colors, but more silhouettes and movement, the tiger's hunting strategy actually works reasonably well in a surprisingly wide range of habitats. Chasing prey out on the open grasslands, though, could pose a problem for this cat that is more bulk muscle than lean speed. With most hunts never reaching cheetah speeds, many African predators never need to run faster than around 30 miles an hour. Leopards, in fact, do quite well in all of Africa, with a similar strategy of stalking and pouncing, using smarts and power, instead of sheer speed. A game plan that Panthera tigris can definitely get its teeth around. In fact, the whole experiment has already been done. Two projects, both challenged by ethical or financial issues, have released several tigers into protected reserves in South Africa. The Lauhu Valley Reserve Project was created in 2002 by a conservation group called Save China's Tigers. The intent was to nurture and rewild captive-born South China in South Africa and eventually release them into a protected natural habitat in China. This tiger subspecies is listed as critically endangered and effectively extinct in the wild. Only about 100 individuals are left in the world all living in zoos or small protected reserves, and all descended from just six wild-caught individuals. The SCT project has proven that captive-born tigers can easily learn to survive and hunt wild African prey species, and several purebred South China tiger cubs have been born to the successful group. The Lauhu Reserve is now home to almost a full 20% of surviving South China tigers, Creating this ex situ conservation breeding group of tigers outside China has added to the security of the species in the wild, while at the same time, has helped to restore a natural biome to a section of South Africa that had been decimated by intensive sheep farming years earlier. Tiger Canyon, also in South Africa, is another fenced reserve and home to a group of hunting and breeding tigers. However, because these tigers are unendangered hybrids, including inbred white tigers. It has no true species conservation value. Acquired through dubious financial means, the project's ethics were further controversial, since the reserve was created solely to make the film Living with Tigers on the Discovery Channel. Though the founder of the reserve was almost killed by one of these tigers in 2012, the reserve is now run as a privately owned for-profit safari lodge. Despite the controversial conservation value of Tiger Canyon, it has helped the Lauhu Valley Reserve to prove tigers can easily survive in Africa. Conflict with native African wildlife and predators could potentially pose problems for any tigers allowed outside these protected reserves. But tigers in places like India and Siberia have proven they are adept at dealing with other large carnivores just fine. It might take a bit of adaptation, but tigers are no slouches when it comes to asserting themselves and thriving whenever given the space and protection to do so. Another hypothetical but interesting option would be for tigers to be inspired by cheetahs and form coalitions. This model of organization could make them the main force of the savanna and could cause serious problems for the lions. The Komodo Dragon the king of the lizards is the world's largest and heaviest reptile, named after the island where humans spotted a dragon-like creature for the first time. The Komodo dragon is an endemic Indonesian species found on Komodo Island and its neighboring islands. These wild dragons typically weigh about 154 pounds or 70 kilograms, but the largest verified specimen reached a length of 10.3 feet or 3.13 meters, and weighed 366 pounds, or 166 kilograms. Males tend to grow larger and bulkier than females. They are incredibly strong and powerful with long, thick bodies, short, muscular legs, and an almighty tail that is used for both fighting and for propping the animal up when it's standing on its hind legs. 
Komodo dragons have 60 razor-sharp teeth, with the ability to replace themselves if damaged or lost. They can go through four or five sets of teeth in their lifetime, as they rely on their razor-sharp teeth and strong claws in attacking their prey. If its prey does not die from the attack, they have an even stronger weapon, their lethal venom. Their saliva contains 50 different strains of toxic bacteria, causing an instant and deadly infection in its prey. Komodo dragons can swallow huge portions of meat swiftly, their stomachs expand quickly, and can consume up to 8% of the dragon's specific body weight in a single meal. Once they have killed their prey, or found a dead or decaying body, several dragons converge to share the meal together. The largest male dragon gets to eat first, followed by smaller males and females, with the juveniles eating the remains last. Many lizards eat plants, but Komodo dragons are carnivorous and eat almost any kind of meat. Scavenging carcasses are stalking animals that range in size from small rodents to large water buffalo. Young feed primarily on small lizards and insects, as well as snakes and birds. If they live to be five years old, they move on to larger prey, such as rodents, monkeys, goats, wild boars, and deer. These reptiles are tertiary predators at the top of their food chain and are also cannibalistic. Although the Komodo dragon can briefly reach speeds of 10 to 13 miles an hour, or 16 to 20 kilometers per hour, its hunting strategy is based on stealth and power. It can spend hours in one spot along a game trail, waiting for a deer or other sizable and nutritious prey to cross its path before launching an attack. Most of the monitor's attempts at bringing down prey are unsuccessful. However, if it can bite its prey, bacteria and venom in its saliva will kill the prey within a few days. After the animal dies, which can take up to four days, the Komodo uses its powerful sense of smell to locate the body. The Komodo dragon's sense of smell is their primary method of detecting food. Using their forked tongues, they test the air for the scent of warm-blooded animals. They have a Jacobson's organ at the roof of their mouth that analyzes the information from the tongue and signals the direction of the potential prey. Their sense of smell is so acute, they can detect the smell of dead or dying animals up to five miles away. Komodo dragons are solitary and powerful predators, roaming territories dependent on the individual's size, covering a distance of around two kilometers every day. They are also known to be excellent swimmers, traveling from one island to another over a relatively long distance. Although they are solitary animals, several Komodo dragons will often gather around a single kill. To catch large animals, these lizards sit for hours, hidden in the vegetation, camouflaged by gray-brown skin. Then they ambush the victim with incredible speed and force. Although the Komodo dragon would have once been widespread across many Indonesian islands, they are today confined to just five, which all lie in the Komodo National Park. The islands of Komodo, Rintja, Gilimontang, Padar, and the western tip of Flores are the last remaining homes for these enormous animals that are most commonly found in open woodlands, along with dry savanna and on scrubby hillsides, and can also be found inhabiting dried up riverbeds. It is thought that Komodo dragons evolved to be so big on these islands due to the presence of several large mammalian species that have since gone extinct. Today, however, they are becoming more threatened in their natural environments with the loss of their habitats to deforestation for timber has pushed the last remaining populations into smaller and more isolated regions. Komodo dragons were discovered by Western scientists at the beginning of the 20th century. Since then, they have been an object of observation and have gradually become a popular tourist attraction. In 1980, Indonesia established the Komodo National Park to preserve and protect the endemic Komodo dragon and other endemic species of the rich marine environment, including the orange-footed scrub fowl and the Timor deer. Today, Komodo National Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The conservation status of the Komodo dragon has classified them as a vulnerable species. Despite all efforts, the influx of tourism can pose a threat to the environmental conditions of the dragon's natural habitat, interfering with their mating process and resulting in a decreased number of offspring. 
Moreover, Komodo dragons that live outside of the national park are also at risk due to the quick shrinking of their habitat, as impacted by the increased human population. Possibly the biggest threats for the lizards are the illegal poachers who steal the dragons to sell them at high prices. As you can see, Komodo dragons are extremely strong animals and have amazing qualities, but can they cope in Africa, among many other powerful animals? In Africa, there are giant tree-dwelling monitor lizards that are similar in size to Komodo dragons, but have a more slender build. The Komodo dragon has a more robust build for ground dwelling. As a hunting method, the Komodo dragon uses a combination of venom and mouth bacteria to deliver a fatal bite to water buffaloes on their hind legs, and then wait for them to die slowly. This method is unlikely to work with African herbivores that have evolved to defend themselves against ambush predators. They would probably notice the danger and run away. Although the Komodo dragon is a semi-aquatic and capable swimmer, it is much smaller than the Nile crocodile, which can reach a maximum size of 5 to 6 meters. Hippos are also very large and dangerous, so living in the water could not be a solution. Because dragons are ambush predators, they may be able to kill the zebra and wildebeest that are so common in the area. Even buffalo and giraffes could be harmed by highly toxic bites. The predators, on the other hand, are what will keep the dragons from spreading far. Dragons get much of their food from scavenging, but hyenas and vultures are more mobile and would easily dominate carcasses before the dragons can get enough food. They might even take the kills of dragons that were depending on venom to do the work. Lions would challenge them, and some would probably die as a result of their lack of caution. But lions prefer to hunt at night, and the lizards would be slaughtered while they slept. Leopards would act similarly. Africa is also famous for its temperamental herbivores. Elephants would sense that the dragons were carnivores, and attack whenever they saw them. Even with its venom, a Komodo dragon is not nearly powerful enough to bring down the largest of all land animals. Rhinos would also probably take issue with them, resulting in gored dragons, and hippos would certainly attack a dragon given the chance. As Komodo is not a rainforest creature, it's unlikely the dragons could survive in the humid Congo, and nothing that large could make it in the Sahara. So, in conclusion, Komodo dragons would not be capable of making it in Africa. Sloth Bears Malursus ursinus so-called due to their slow-moving habits, are also known as the Indian bear or honey bear. They are considered vulnerable by the ICUN as humans encroach on their habitat, hunt them for their meat, and capture them to perform as pets. There are thought to be fewer than 20,000 individuals left in the wild. So, with a dwindling existence in India, could sloth bears survive in Africa? To answer this question, we need to consider the sloth bear's natural habitat diet, and the environment in which it lives. Whilst a common predecessor of all bears is thought to have emerged in Asia 30 to 40 million years ago, sloth bears evolved within the Indian subcontinent during the Pleistocene. An intermediary species of bear, called Malursus theobaldi, is thought to have been the link between brown bears and sloth bears, which lived earlier during the Pliocene. Firstly, what do sloth bears look like? Sloth bears are medium-sized bears ranging in weight from 50 to 150 kilograms, or 110 to 330 pounds. They have black, shaggy fur with a tan beige snout and a characteristic white bib on their chest. Their long fur forms a kind of mane, and their hairy ears protect them from biting insects on which they feed. They are well adapted to this kind of prey, and their nostrils can close completely to stop them from crawling in whilst feeding. They have the longest tail of any bear species, but their unique characteristic is the shape of their muzzle, with a lower lip that extends upwards and over its nose. The shape of its mouth allows it to suck up large numbers of insects. Typically, these are ants and termites, and exhibits feeding behavior reminiscent of other mammalian insectivores. Their front paws are large, with long, curved claws that are used for digging into termite mounds and bees' nests to access the insects and honey. Where did sloth bears come from? The evolutionary history of bears is somewhat debated. The sloth bear is a member of the Ursini, a subfamily of bears that comprises six extant species. The polar bear, brown bear, 
American black bear, sun bear, Asiatic black bear, and the sloth bear. The origins of these bears can be traced back to the early Pliocene around 5 million years ago. But the evolutionary history of today's bears is a complex one. And even with our advanced genetic sequencing and DNA mapping techniques, there is debate about the relationships between bear species. Sometimes the sloth bear is considered a sister species to the sun bear, other times it is not. It seems sloth bears evolved in India though, and as well as living on the subcontinent, sloth bears also live in parts of Nepal, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka. There aren't any sloth bears living in Africa. Today, no species of bear are found on the African continent, but this wasn't always the case. Africa did once have its species of bear. Between 11 and a half and 2 and a half million years ago, the continent was home to the Agriotherium africanum. This was a large bear that fed mostly on plant material, but was likely omnivorous, like many of today's bears. The bear stood at 2 meters or 7 feet tall on its hind legs and weighed up to 750 kilograms or 1,650 pounds. It is the only bear known to have colonized sub-Saharan Africa. North of the Sahara was another species of bear called the Atlas bear and, as the name suggests, it roamed the Atlas Mountains in North Africa. They were a much more recent species of African bear than the Agriotherium. Overhunting led to its extinction in the late 1800s. Since the time of Agriotherium, the climate on the African continent has changed. The environment and ecology found there nowadays are different, and sloth bears would live in a different niche than that of this prehistoric bear. What is considered a sloth bear habitat, and can we find these in Africa? Sloth bears occupy a range of habitats, such as tropical forests, scrublands, savannas, and grasslands. Today, much of Western and Central Africa is covered in tropical forests. These include both moist and dry tropical forests and encompasses an area more than 3.6 million square kilometers. They comprise 18% of the world's tropical forests, which could provide potential habitat for sloth bears. Furthermore, almost half of Africa is covered in savanna, with a total area of 13 million square kilometers. These open grasslands could also be considered habitat for the sloth bear. They prefer habitats with boulders and shrubs that can provide cover for them. Sloth bears would likely find enough habitat to survive in Africa. But what about their diet? Sloth bears primarily feed on insects, but also consume fruit. They are nocturnal foragers, much like Africa's aardvark. This nocturnal mammal uses its long tongue to extract termites from nests and uses its claws to break them open. They live in burrows on the African savanna, sleeping for much of the day. Sloth bears would occupy a very similar niche to aardvarks, although the bears would spend much of the day in caves rather than underground, and they can be found resting in trees during the heat of the day. Other potential competitors for food in Africa include a variety of reptiles and the aardwolf. This hyena-like mammal can consume as many as 300,000 termites in a single night. Its nocturnal habits during the summer are similar to those of the aardvark. They feed during the day to conserve heat at night, curled up in their burrows. Unlike aardvarks and sloth bears, they are careful not to destroy a termite mound or devour the entire colony so that the termites can rebuild and repopulate, ensuring a continuous supply of food for the aardwolf. In Africa, there are plenty of termites and ants for sloth bears to feast on. There is also a wide variety of fruit. In India, sloth bears eat mangoes and figs. Both of these are abundant throughout Africa. So, in terms of food, it seems that there would be plenty for sloth bears to eat if they lived in Africa. However, sloth bears would compete with aardvarks and aardwolves on Africa's open grasslands. They could prove disastrous for aardwolves, as the bears are known to demolish termite mounds, using their powerful claws and paws to break them open. The careful nature of the aardwolf may not be able to compete. Does Africa have the right sort of climate for sloth bears to survive? Unlike other species like black bears and brown bears, the sloth bear doesn't hibernate due to the warm climate in which it lives. But in the wild, they usually have a period of inactivity during the rainy season. This behavior would serve them well in the African bush. Although nighttime temperatures can plummet, there aren't long winter seasons as there are in other places in the world. There are a variety of climates across Africa that are similar to those found in the Indian subcontinent. The climate of Central Africa, for example, is very similar to that of India. 
lying within the tropics and subtropics. Central Africa has an average annual temperature of 20 to 32 degrees Celsius, or 68 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same average temperatures found within India. Rainfall is slightly higher in Central Africa than the whole of India, and humidity is greater. Even so, it seems the climate of the two regions is comparable, making parts of Africa, like the Central region, hospitable for sloth bears. Would sloth bears be predated by any animals in Africa? Often, tigers avoid sloth bears, as their long, sharp claws can inflict serious injuries. Sloth bear mothers usually stand their ground and will charge at a tiger if it's under threat. It may also carry its cubs up trees to avoid attacks. Some tigers hide near termite mounds, waiting for sloth bears to come along. They will then pounce on their unsuspecting prey from behind, therefore avoiding the risk of injury from the bear. In Africa, sloth bears may fall prey to the likes of lions, hyenas, jackals, and leopards. They would have to adapt their predator avoidance tactics. In India, they are responsive to the warning calls of samba deer, which alert them to the presence of tigers. In Africa, vervet monkeys are known to produce different alarm calls, depending on the nature of the threat. These can be aerial threats, such as those from eagles, tree-dwelling threats, such as those from snakes, or threats from the ground, like those from leopards. Based on habitat, climate, and food available, we believe that sloth bears could survive in certain parts of Africa. They would likely have a significant impact on the ecosystem that already exists there. They may compete with the aardvark and the aardwolves for food, and would be considered prey for several African predatory species. If living in Africa, they may still come under similar pressures that threaten their species in India, such as the encroachment of human growth on wild habitats. Lynxes are medium-sized cats belonging to the genus Lynx. There are four species, the Eurasian Lynx, Bobcat, Canada Lynx, and the endangered Iberian Lynx. They are characterized by their short tails and tufts to the tips of their ears. The four species vary in color from beige to goldish brown. Some have black spots and all have white chests and underbellies. The largest species is the Eurasian lynx, weighing in at 66 pounds and standing up to 27.5 inches at the shoulder. The smallest is the bobcat, weighing a maximum of 30 pounds and standing up to 24 inches tall. The four different species are found in a range of countries across Europe, Asia, Canada, and North America. They prefer high-altitude forests with dense foliage within the temperate zone. They mostly hunt on the ground, but are also excellent swimmers and tree climbers. They are highly territorial cats, marking their range with urine and feces and clawing trees. They are primarily solitary, only coming into contact with one another during breeding and when a mother raises her young. The Iswar lynx is an extinct species that lived in Europe and Africa during the Pliocene and Pleistocene epochs. Today's lynxes are thought to have originated in Africa. Fossils date back to the early or mid-Pliocene. The diversification of lynxes over these epochs was largely through the differentiation of body size due to competition with other carnivores. Today's Iberian lynx was a direct descendant of the extinct Iswar lynx. In Asia, the Iswar lynx gave rise to the Eurasian lynx, which migrated into Europe and ultimately into North America, giving rise to the Canada lynx. But could modern-day lynxes survive in Africa? In order to answer this question, we can consider the lynx's natural habitat, diet, and the competition it may face. Firstly, habitat. Lynxes are found throughout temperate habitats. They do not live in polar or tropical regions. They have large paws, which help to spread their weight as they walk through deep snow. In fact, a 30-pound lynx can have larger paws than a 200-pound mountain lion. Those found in colder climates also have dense fur to keep them warm in the harsh winters. They typically inhabit areas covered in foliage and shrubbery. This helps keep them hidden when they stalk their prey, getting within a few meters before pouncing on it. Bobcats survive in semi-arid regions and swamps, as well as forested areas. Occupying a range of habitats makes the genus robust. However, the Iberian lynx is the most endangered cat species in the world. 
This is largely due to habitat loss. They once lived with Eurasian lynxes during the Pleistocene, before going their separate ways and occupying separate habitats and geographical locations. There are minimal temperate zones across Africa. Those that do exist are towards the south. Some African countries have temperatures similar to those found in Eurasia and have snowfall which lynxes are adapted for. However, this habitat and climate are not widespread. For lynxes to thrive in Africa, they would need to be able to occupy a range of habitats over a significant geographical area. If there were enough reserves and national parks within the temperate zone to maintain a population of lynxes, they might be able to survive in Africa. Over time, they would adapt to the warmer climate with changes in body size, fur density, and paw size. They may also adapt their behavior to suit their needs, such as preferring to remain at higher altitudes in the mountains, where it is cooler, or taking regular dips in water like jaguars do. In terms of habitat, it is possible that lynxes could survive in Africa given the time to adapt. Their ancestors indeed originated from Africa, but the climate and habitat differed back then and were not comparable to today. Now let's consider diet. Lynxes rely on their incredible hearing and eyesight to locate prey. The tufts on their ears act as hearing aids and help to detect motion. They can see a mouse from 250 feet away and have been known to take down prey four times their size. They are carnivores, eating a variety of animals. They hunt them at night, stealthily stalking their prey before pouncing and using their sharp claws and teeth to latch on. When they attack large prey, the lynx will bite the neck, suffocating the animal with puncture wounds to its windpipe. The Canada lynx tends to feed on similar animals like mice, squirrels, and birds, but its favorite food is the snowshoe hare. In fact, they are so dependent on them that the Canadian lynx population fluctuates with that of the snowshoe hare. The larger Eurasian lynx also eat small mammals and birds, but in addition, can hunt bigger animals like deer. The smallest of the lynx genus, the bobcat, also hunts smaller animals like rabbits, rodents, and waterfowl. They can hunt small deer and generally adapt their prey selection depending on season and habitat. In Africa, there would be plentiful food sources for lynxes. Comparable in size to the roe and red deer they naturally hunt would be the springbok, kudu, impala, and blesbok. Similarly, there are various fox species, including the red fox found in Europe and America, jackals, and genets that could be considered alternatives to the red fox that lynxes hunt in their home range. In Africa, there are also plenty of rabbits, hares, and rodents. The prey species available throughout Africa would be similar in size and nature to the lynx's natural diet. Therefore, when we consider diet, we believe that the lynx would thrive in Africa. These prey animals already fall victim to some of Africa's predators. Some of these could be considered competition for lynxes. So finally, we need to consider the competition. Lions, leopards, cheetahs, and hyenas all occupy similar niches. They are carnivorous predators that hunt a variety of animals ranging from rabbits, rodents, and warthogs to impala, zebra, and buffalo. Despite eating similar animals and living in similar habitats, Africa's greatest predators all coexist without outcompeting one another. Research suggests that resources available to prey species in Africa, such as prey and habitat, are essential for coexistence. These apex predators do not actively avoid each other as much as we once thought. Their home ranges and territories often overlap each other significantly. One of Africa's cats occupies a niche that lynxes would fit into. Caracals are comparable in size to lynxes, although slightly smaller, and they consume similar prey. They live in dry savannas, semi-deserts, woodlands, and mountainous regions. Like lynxes, Caracals are nocturnal and hunt small mammals and birds as well as larger game, such as kudu and impala. 80% of the caracal's diet comprises mammals, with birds, reptiles, and insects making up the rest. Their method of hunting is the same as lynxes, consisting of a bite to the neck leading to suffocation. They often compete with foxes, hyenas, and leopards. From the point of view of competition, 
It seems lynxes and caracals could compete with each other. If there was enough space, habitat, and prey available, it is possible that these two medium-sized cats could live side by side. However, as habitat loss is on the rise in numerous wildlife regions across Africa, competition amongst predators could lead to local extinctions. So, in conclusion, we don't think that lynxes could survive in Africa in today's world. Although their ancestors once roamed the continent, today's Africa is very different. We believe that there may not be enough suitable habitat within the temperate zone to allow this genus to thrive. Although it is possible that they could adapt and evolve to survive warmer temperatures, this would take generations. The diet of lynxes is very similar to other small and medium-sized African cats. There would be an abundance of prey that the lynx has adapted to hunting exceptionally well. These prey species are similar to those found in the lynx's home range. We also think that there would be fierce competition from cats already living in Africa. The lynx is slightly bigger and heavier than the African caracal, so it could outcompete this species when it came to maintaining territories or making sizable kills. However, the caracal is more suited to the African environment and would cope better with the climate. The big cats and dogs living in Africa today manage to live side by side without threatening the existence of each other. But is there space for yet one more apex predator? What do you think? Jaguars are the only big cat in the Americas and the third biggest cat in the world after tigers and lions. These powerful cats were worshipped as gods in many ancient South American cultures, and representations of the jaguar show up in the art and archaeology of the pre-Columbian cultures across the jaguar's range. The word jaguar comes from the indigenous word jaguar, which means the killer which overcomes its prey in a single bound. The jaguar is a compact and well-muscled animal. Rainforest jaguars are generally darker and considerably smaller than those found in open areas, possibly due to the fewer large herbivorous prey in forest areas. Jaguars grow to be about 1.6 to 1.8 meters or 5.3 to 6 feet in length and stand about 67 to 76 centimeters or 27 to 30 inches tall at the shoulders. On average, Jaguars weigh around 36 kilograms or 80 pounds, but larger specimens have been recorded as weighing 131 to 151 kilograms or 288 to 333 pounds. Historically, these cats ranged from virtually the entire South American continent all the way to the southern half of the United States. Fossilized remains of jaguars have been found in Missouri, dating back to the Ice Age. As recent as the early 20th century, jaguars could be found as far north as the Grand Canyon and as far west as Monterey, California. Currently, jaguars have been restricted to a fraction of their previous range. Jaguar populations in the United States are now virtually non-existent, with only a few sightings in the past decade or so. Their current range stretches from Mexico to South America, but that range is highly fragmented. This means that jaguar populations have large spaces between them where no jaguars are found. This fragmented habitat prevents jaguar populations from breeding with one another and reduces genetic diversity. Jaguars can be found most frequently in dense, flooded rainforests. This could be due to preference and shy nature. Or it could be because dry habitats have been rapidly developed in their range. While they are most commonly found near water sources and in rainforests, jaguars have been spotted in and have historically inhabited grasslands, subtropical forests, and deciduous forests. The majority of a jaguar's hunting is done down on the ground, but they are also known to hunt for prey both in the water and from the trees from where the jaguar can easily ambush its prey, often killing it with one powerful bite. Jaguars have a more powerful bite than any other cat on the planet, and the second most powerful bite of all mammals. Their jaws are powerful enough to deliver a deadly bite that punctures the skull and the brain, which is exactly how jaguars kill. They may not be the biggest, strongest, 
or deadliest killers in the Felid family. But when it comes to biting, jaguars take the cake. Medium-sized mammals make up the majority of the jaguar's diet, including deer, capybara, peccaries, and tapirs, which they stalk in silence through the dense jungle. When in the water, jaguars hunt turtles, fish, and even small caiman when the opportunity presents itself. The jaguar is known to be a formidable and aggressive hunter, and is thought to eat more than 80 different animal species to supplement its diet. With growing human settlements, the jaguar has also been blamed by ranch owners for stealing their livestock, particularly in areas that encroach on the jaguar's territory. Although this elusive animal spends most of its time either resting in the safety of the trees or hunting in the dense undergrowth, jaguars are animals that love to be nearby water, such as floodplains and slow-moving rivers and they rarely venture into arid, more desert-like areas. The jaguar is an excellent swimmer and can move through the water at a surprising speed, particularly when in pursuit of prey. While the jaguar employs the deep throat bite and suffocation technique typical among panthera, it prefers a killing method unique amongst cats. It pierces directly through the temporal bones of the skull between the ears of the prey with its canine teeth piercing the brain. This may be an adaptation to cracking open turtle shells. Following the late Pleistocene extinctions, armored reptiles such as turtles would have formed an abundant prey base for the jaguar. The skull bite is employed with mammals in particular. With reptiles such as the caiman, the jaguar may leap on the back of its prey and sever the cervical vertebrae, immobilizing the target. The jaguar is a stalk and ambush Rather than a chase predator, the cat will walk slowly down forest paths, listening for and stalking prey before rushing or ambushing. The jaguar attacks from cover, and usually from a target's blind spot, with a quick pounce. The species' ambushing abilities are considered nearly peerless in the animal kingdom by both indigenous people and field researchers, and are probably a product of its role as an apex predator in several different environments. The ambush may include leaping into the water after prey, as a jaguar is quite capable of carrying a large kill while swimming. Its strength is such that a carcass as large as a heifer can be hauled up a tree to avoid flood levels. On killing prey, the jaguar will drag the carcass to a thicket or other secluded spot. It begins eating at the neck and chest, rather than the midsection. The heart and lungs are consumed, followed by the shoulders. As with many other cat species, the jaguar is a solitary animal, except for the first couple of years that jaguar cubs spend with their mother. Males are particularly territorial, and although their home range will overlap those of several females, they will defend their patch fiercely from other males. Jaguars mark their territories with urine by scratching marks onto trees and asserting themselves with growling vocal calls. Due to the large size and dominant nature of the jaguar, there are no other wild animals that are known to actually consider it as prey. As you can see, jaguars are extremely strong cats and have amazing qualities. But can they cope in Africa among lions, hyenas, and many other powerful animals? There is plenty of game in Africa, and they could certainly adapt to the climate. But adding another apex predator into a new environment is most often disastrous. To avoid competition, some predators evolved to be nocturnal. Others took to the mountains. Some are larger. Some are faster. Some hunt in packs. Others are solitary. It's a balance that should not be disturbed. Because jaguars are apex predators in the Americas, the biggest issue would be the megafauna. But the Nile crocodiles, lions, hyenas, and African wild dogs would teach the jaguars manners. Not only predators, but everything in Africa appears to have an attitude issue, whether it's rhinos, hippos, baboons, or the mighty elephant. Jaguars coexisted with lions, short-faced bears, dire wolves, and Smilodon in the Americas 10,000 years ago and survived because of their resourcefulness. 
climbing as well as leopards, strong enough to hunt big game like lions, swimming like crocodiles. With a variety of ecosystems in Africa from desert to rainforest, the jaguars would thrive. Jaguars can be found in a variety of habitats throughout the Americas. For predators, survival necessitates excellent hunting techniques. When sea turtles lay their eggs on beaches, jaguars kill and devour them. However, many other jaguars are dining on the same beach, and there is no territorial fighting between them, which is unusual for solitary cats. They bite into the skulls of the caimans, stick their tails in the water to grab fish, are strong enough to kill domestic cattle, tapirs, and anaconda. Jaguar hunt monkeys, sloths, and iguanas in trees, and are agile enough to catch birds. They used to slay elephant-sized giant ground sloths by themselves during the Ice Age. They kill, unlike any other cat, by biting into the skull and paralyzing their prey with a bite force of 2,000 psi. As a result, their kills would be faster, quieter, and more efficient than a suffocating lion or leopard. Another interesting hypothetical option would be for jaguars to eventually mate with leopards, resulting in a natural hybrid, or take on the niche that tigers occupy in Asia by growing as large as or larger than lions. Though lions would dominate until they evolve, even a highly confident male leopard can cause confusion and uneasiness in a lion, especially when combined with a male jaguar that can grow to the size of a lioness. Although, because lions, hyenas, and wild dogs are all pack hunters, the odds are always in their favor. Jaguars, like leopards, are strong enough to cache their kills up trees, which could solve that problem. Hunting animals that no other predator would, such as crocodiles, would also be a game changer. The grizzly bear is the second largest land carnivore in North America. They are 3.3 to 9 feet, or 1 to 2.8 meters in length, and weigh 800 pounds, or 363 kilograms. When they stand upright on their hind legs, they can reach 8 feet, or 2.4 meters tall. It is distinguished from other bears by the large shoulder hump that supports its massive front legs, its extremely long front claws, and the concave facial profile of its large head. The grizzly bear's fur is usually darkish brown, but can vary from ivory yellow to black. It has long hairs on its head and shoulders that often have white tips and give the bear the grizzled appearance from which it derives its name. Despite its large size, the grizzly bear has been known to run at speeds of 55 kilometers an hour. It has well-developed senses of smell and hearing that compensates for its poor eyesight. Historically, the grizzly was numerous south into California and Mexico and ranged across the western half of North America, approximately to the eastern boundary of Manitoba. As human populations have grown, the grizzly's range has gradually shrunk and is now limited to Alaska western Canada, and parts of the northwestern United States. Grizzlies are highly adaptable and flourish in high mountain forests, subalpine meadows, arctic tundra, wetlands, grasslands, mixed conifer forests, and coastal areas. Although sometimes portrayed in the media as voracious predators, grizzly bears are normally reclusive creatures. Grizzly bears are intelligent, curious, and have an excellent memory, particularly regarding where food sources are located. They have good eyesight and excellent senses of hearing and smell. Grizzly bears are active during the day and night, but will often alter their habits to avoid humans in areas of high human use. In the heat of the day, grizzly bears will rest in daybeds in dense vegetation. Bears are generally solitary. Although they may tolerate other bears when food is plentiful, grizzlies have a social hierarchy in which adult male bears dominate the best habitats and food sources, generally followed by mature females with cubs, then by other single adult bears, sub-adult bears, who are just learning to live on their own away from their mother's protection, are most likely to be living in poor quality habitats or in areas near roads and developments. Thus, 
Young adult bears are most vulnerable to danger from humans and other bears, and to be conditioned to human foods. Grizzly bears are omnivores. The most commonly eaten kinds of plants are fleshy roots, fruits, berries, grasses, and forbs. If grizzly bears are on the hunt, their prey can include fish, especially salmon, rodents like ground squirrels, carrion, and hoofed animals like moose, elk, caribou, and deer. They are especially good at catching the young of these hoofed species. Grizzly bears can also target domestic animals like cattle and sheep and cause economically important losses for some ranchers. The National Wildlife Federation has a program on national forest land surrounding Yellowstone Park to prevent attacks on domestic livestock by purchasing the grazing allotments from ranchers. Winter can be very tough for many species of wildlife because the season brings harsh weather and little food. Grizzly bears hibernate in warm dens during the winter to minimize energy expenditure at a time when the natural foods are not available and to permit their tiny young to be born in a warm and secure environment. Throughout the summer and autumn, grizzly bears build up fat reserves by consuming as much food as they can find. In late fall or winter, the bears find a hillside and dig a hole to serve as their winter den. When inside the den, grizzly bears slow down their heart rate reduce their temperature and metabolic activity, and live off stored fat reserves. Pregnant females give birth in the dens and nurse their cubs until they are large enough to venture outside in the spring as snow melts and new food becomes available. Depending on the length of the winter season, grizzly bears can stay in their dens for up to seven months. They don't even go to the bathroom during this time. Grizzly bear hibernation is not as deep of a sleep as some other hibernators, like bats or ground squirrels, and they will quickly wake up when disturbed. Movies and television shows will portray grizzlies as aggressive towards humans. However, humans are the greatest threat to bears. These bears keep to themselves and avoid humans. They will flee from dangerous situations, but will become aggressive when threatened. If animals or humans try to harm grizzlies or their cubs, the bears can become violent quickly and will attack. About half of grizzly cubs do not live to reach adulthood because of diseases and grizzly predators that include mountain lions, wolves, and adult male grizzlies. As you can see, grizzly bears are extremely strong animals and have amazing qualities, but can they cope in the African savanna among lions, hyenas, and many other powerful animals? Savannas are home to a wide diversity of animals. The largest land mammal can be found there. So can the most deadly snake, the black mamba. The savanna is most popular with herbivores, which can dine on the diverse grasses found there during the wet season. There are more than 40 species of hoofed mammals living in the savannas. Because there are so many plant eaters, there are also lots of predators. Lions, cheetahs, and leopards can all be found coexisting in African savannas. You can also find jackals, hyenas, and predatory birds. While they do compete for food, some of them survive the same way the grazers do, preying on different types of food. For example, the type of grazers a pride of lions can bring down is very different than what a lone cheetah might try to hunt. At the moment, there are no bear species in Africa. There was a time when the brown bear roamed the Atlas Mountains, where they were once native. They'd made their way from Europe all the way to the top of Africa. The Roman Empire largely attributed to the decline of the Atlas bear. Although they were hunted as sport, the Romans would capture the bears and use them in arenas. The gladiators would take their chances against lions, tigers, and bears. Human activity, overhunting, and the popularity of zoos were other contributions to the extinction of the Atlas bear. In some parts of Africa, like Sub-Saharan, Ethiopia, and South Africa, scientists discovered fossilized bear bones. These bear species existed millions of years ago and are therefore very different from the bears we are familiar with today. Agriotherium africanum was about 900 kilograms in weight. That's more than twice the weight of today's largest bears. 
bear evolution reveals that they were fierce fighters with the largest bite of any bear ever known. Due to competition, the Agriotherium africanum became extinct. Even though they were large and capable of fighting, life in Africa was, and still is, difficult. Finding a mate and protecting themselves from threats were also challenges. Because they were mostly solitary beings, grizzly bears are cold climate animals, built to withstand frigid winters in Montana and Alaska, not the blistering heat of Kenya's dry season. In its natural habitat, fat and fur are beneficial, but not so much in Africa. They also spend a lot of time in and around water, hunting fish. The African savanna is a dry place. The grizzly bear would die of heat exhaustion or thirst in a week. Also, because crocodiles abound in Africa's few waters, bears should learn to avoid them. Otherwise, every dip into the water could result in death. Even if we disregard that, bears aren't built to handle the African locals. They're overmatched by Africa's finest in size, power, or speed in nearly every case. The top savanna predators, lions and hyenas, are both social hunters that would probably target a lone bear as prey. There are things they can eat, zebra, wildebeest, antelopes of various sizes, and buffalo, but overheating would be a major danger. To avoid overheating, big cats only hunt these animals in short bursts of speed. Longer hunts are undertaken by painted dogs, which are small, lean, and built for endurance. A bear would have to kill very quickly to avoid overheating. That being said, we believe that grizzly bears could not survive in the African savanna. Despite its small size, the wolverine is an animal that has earned a ferocious reputation as a top predator in the wild. This species looks like a small bear, but the facts suggest it's closely related to the weasel, another small but aggressive creature. Wolverines have a wide variety of nicknames. They are known throughout the contiguous United States as the Glutton, Woods Devil, Indian Devil, and Skunk Bear. The Wolverine has a heavy set, muscular body that measures 65 to 105 centimeters, or 26 to 41 inches in length excluding the tail. It weighs around 9 to 17 kilograms, or 22 to 36 pounds, with males as much as 30% larger than the females. Their fur is long and dense and does not retain much water, making it very resistant to frost which is common in the wolverine's cold habitat. Their feet are equipped with pads, which enable them to travel easily through heavy snow. These animals have strong teeth and powerful jaws, which allow them to devour every bite of their prey including hind, hooves, and bone. They possess a special upper molar in the back of their mouth that is rotated 90 degrees, or sideways, towards the inside of the mouth. This special characteristic allows them to tear off meat from their prey or carrion that has been frozen solid, and also to crush bones, which enables the wolverine to extract the marrow. Wolverines have very poor eyesight. However, they have very good hearing and a strong sense of smell, allowing them to smell food underneath the snow. They have been known to give off a very strong, extremely unpleasant odor giving rise to the nickname Skunk Bear. The creature's strong body build and movement pattern allow it to walk surprisingly well across the snow at speeds up to 30 miles per hour or 48 kilometers an hour. The wolverine is also a capable swimmer and climber, which sometimes helps it escape from predators. The wolverine is a highly independent species that prefers a life of solitude. They rarely get along with members of the same sex, and the breeding season is the only time they tolerate members of the same species. The den, which is the central nexus of the wolverine's life, usually consists of a small cave, rock crevice, fallen tree, or pre-existing burrow in which it can create a rough bed of grass and leaves. Wolverine is best described as an omnivorous species that can opportunistically change its diet based on season and location. Berries and plants are the main fares in the summer season, while rabbits, 
rodents, and leftover carrion constitute the bulk of its diet for the rest of the year, particularly in the sparse winter months. It is so tenacious that it can take on prey up to five times larger than itself, usually when the prey is wounded or stranded in deep snow. The wolverine kills its prey with a bite to the neck, which severs the tendons and crushes the throat. Wolverine is a clever animal that will look for any way to steal another kill from other predators to avoid expending time and energy on the hunt. It has been known to drive away much larger animals such as bears and cougars and then take over and consume the carcass of the animal they killed. Wolverines are a shy species, so don't expect to see one out in the wild. They are constantly on the move, looking for their next meal. When more food is available, wolverines don't have to walk as far. On average, the males have a home range of approximately 1,000 square kilometers, while females stay within 100 square kilometers. Some studies suggest that the wolverine is quite a canny and intelligent animal. It has been known to play with toys and objects. It can follow human roads that have minimal traffic to speed up its travel time and it can sneak baits out of traps that are set by scientists to collar the animal. Despite its relatively smaller size, the wolverine has few other natural predators. The sharp claws and ferocious attitude will deter most other animals from threatening it. Wolf is probably the closest thing it has to a regular predator, because an entire pack can pin down a wolverine and prevent it from escaping. In fact, wolverines and wolves sometimes don't even appear in the same territory together. Bears, eagles, and mountain lions may also target a young wolverine and kill it. The greatest threat is humanity. The wolverine was once hunted and killed throughout North America and Europe for its fur. This practice is much less common today, but it has yet to recover in some parts of its former range, perhaps due to habitat loss. In the future, as the Arctic warms, climate change could alter some parts of its natural habitat in complex ways. As you can see, wolverines are great animals and have amazing qualities. But can they cope in Africa? Africa's climate would be one of the biggest problems for wolverines. Wolverines are hyperborean. They currently live in cold, high-latitude regions across vast stretches of Canada, Russia, and Scandinavia. Wolverine is no longer endemic to the United States, except for Alaska and some sporadic and isolated sections of the Rocky Mountains and the Sierras of California. The huge, uninhabited boreal forest and tundra are most suitable for its lifestyle because they offer the most territory to roam around in. Lesotho, a landlocked country completely surrounded by South Africa, is the coldest country in Africa, where temperatures of negative 10 degrees Celsius are common in the cold season, and the winter average hovers around 0 degrees Celsius. It is very mountainous and holds the world record for the highest low point of any country. Lesotho is rich in wildlife and has more species of birds than mammals. There are about 339 bird species compared to 60 mammalian species. There are also many kinds of reptiles and insects. But even this place is inadequate for the wolverine's needs. Even in their natural habitat, they suffer from global warming because they need deep snow where they can dig dens to protect their young and they don't tolerate warm temperatures. The most similar creature in Africa is the smaller honey badger. Both species have an infamous reputation for ferociousness and strength. In some accounts, they are even considered the two toughest members of the weasel family. However, the wolverine is indubitably more energetic, clever, elusive, and receptive as compared to the badger, which, in turn, excels in physical versatility in ways of digging, swimming, and climbing. In terms of hunting and diet, the wolverine, a carnivore, is more accustomed to taking medium-sized mammals like deer, sheep, and small bears for its prey. Furthermore, the wolverine's fierceness and strength disproportionate to its size allows it to take on prey those of many times its size, such as moose. Wolverines may be larger and heavier, 
but the honey badger has more defensive techniques than a wolverine has. Honey badgers have thick skin, which can bear the sting of insects and bites of big cats, whereas wolverines have loose skin. Wolverines are known to fight with wolves and cougars. On the other hand, honey badgers are known to take on lions, wild dogs, leopards, and hyenas. The wolverine's aggressive nature does not make them an easy meal, and given their small size, predators' efforts are often better spent catching an easier meal with more meat. But that doesn't mean they can live a quiet, carefree life there. The leopards, lions, hyenas, and African wild dogs could occasionally hunt them. Not only predators, but everything in Africa appears to have an attitude issue, whether it's rhinos, hippos, baboons, or the mighty elephant. So, they should learn to keep their distance and pay close attention to what is going on around them. Playing a major character in fairy tales and mythology throughout the ages, the Grey Wolf, also known as the Timber Wolf, has been perceived in many different lights, from big, bad wolf to spiritual being. In reality, grey wolves may not embody such extreme vices and virtues, but they do play a vital role in maintaining ecological harmony. Keen senses, large canine teeth, powerful jaws, and the ability to pursue prey at 60 kilometers or 37 miles per hour equip the grey wolf well for a predatory way of life. A typical northern male can be about 2 meters or 6.6 .6 feet long, including the bushy half-meter long tail. Standing 76 centimeters or 30 inches tall at the shoulder, it weighs about 45 kilograms or 100 pounds, but weight ranges from 14 to 65 kilograms or 31 to 143 pounds, depending on the geographical area. Females average about 20% smaller than males. Although they are referred to as gray wolves, these canids actually range in color from solid white, gray, and brown. The social structure of a wolf pack is one of the most fascinating that has ever been observed. They have a very strict level of hierarchy that has to be adhered to by all of the members of the pack. This may sound harsh initially, but it is a method that allows these packs of wolves to be able to survive. The leader of the pack is the alpha male, and his mate is the beta female. Many believe that the social order of a pack is determined by fear and dominance of the one in charge. However, it isn't necessarily established by an attack on one, and the winner is the leader. It is much more complex than that. Through careful research, experts have found that this type of social structure helps to promote unity and social order. It also helps to reduce conflicts and to lower the chances of aggressive behaviors occurring among the members of the pack. The upper level of the social structure doesn't change very often. However, it can a little bit at the lower levels. Living in a pack not only facilitates the raising and feeding of pups, coordinated and collaborative hunting, and the defense of territory. It also allows for the formation of many unique emotional bonds between pack members, the foundation for cooperative living. It is during a hunt where cooperation between wolves within a pack is most apparent. Wolves are opportunists. They test their prey, sensing any weakness or vulnerability through visual cues and even through hearing and scent. Contrary to ambush predators that rely on the element of surprise and a short, intense burst of energy to secure their prey, wolves are endurance or coursing predators. They chase their prey over long distances, sometimes even a few miles, to find the right animal or opportunity. On the hunt, wolves work together with certain individuals typically carrying out their specific role in the hunt, often based on age, gender, and social standing. The home range of a pack of wolves can overlap with that of other wolves. As long as the food is plentiful, they will usually ignore each other and continue on their way. When food is scarce though, they may battle to determine which pack has the right to feed there. The average grey wolf can eat up to 20 pounds in a single sitting, but they need to eat almost 4 pounds of meat a day to sustain themselves in normal conditions. That, along with the fact that wolves hunt as a pack, leads grey wolves to focus their attention on larger prey species. In most habitats, grey wolves rely on packs of ungulates, or large hoofed prey animals, to sustain their ravenous appetites. Elk, 
Moose and white-tailed deer are some of the more prominent prey species that wolves feed on. As opportunistic hunters with large appetites, wolves are reliant on the habits of prey populations for survival. The typical wolf can eat 15 to 20 pack animals in a year, and those numbers can grow impressive when you take into account larger pack sizes. The winter months tend to be the most bountiful for wolves, as it leaves them with more access to weak and undernourished prey. And because wolves often have an advantage over prey when hunting through snow and tundra, early summer is also a generous time for feeding thanks to the higher presence of younger prey animals. Wolves also eat smaller prey like hares, raccoons, mice, and beavers. But the necessity of having larger prey to feast on means that the wolf often cover long distances as they follow the migration patterns of their prey. These animals are apex predators, which means that they are at the top of the food chain within their designated territories. Still, they stick together in packs for a good reason. There are plenty of bigger, meaner animals who are willing to consider them as prey. In general, these animals need to watch out for bears and large cats like tigers or mountain lions. When they work together, a pack can take down a polar bear, but a wolf alone might not be so lucky. The actual biggest threat to any wolf is human interaction. They often get shot by poachers, licensed hunters, and farmers who are attempting to protect their livestock. These animals also suffer from climate change caused by deforestation. When humans move in, their territory gets smaller, reducing their prey options and making survival difficult. The human presence is often credited as the reason for the drastic decline in the wolf presence across North America over the last 100 years. As you can see, Gray wolves are great hunters and have amazing qualities, but can they cope in Africa among lions, hyenas, and wild dogs? We can't rule out the possibility of wolves surviving in the Serengeti just because it's hotter than the Great Plains or the Canadian Arctic. Plenty of wolves live in similar environments, like in India, Iran, or Israel. Indeed, those three countries have their own subspecies of gray wolves, called Canis lupus pilipe, a small desert-adapted gray wolf that specializes in catching antelope. If placed in the African savanna, gray wolves could evolve into a similar shape if left unmolested. There are several problems with this though. Gray wolves are a highly mobile species and could have colonized Africa long ago by crossing the Sinai Peninsula from Israel into Egypt, but they never have. You may be wondering why they didn't do it. Well, when you're entering a new environment, it is important for there to be a vacant ecological niche for the intruding animal to fill. It just so happens that every conceivable niche a gray wolf could fill has been taken by other species. The big game hunting niche has been taken by lions, spotted hyenas, and African wild dogs. Gray wolves would face competition from jackals, African golden wolves, and Ethiopian wolves even if they tried to lower their ambitions and become garbage-eating foragers. Furthermore, the potential for becoming the lunch of some other predator is far higher in Africa than in any other continent wolves currently inhabit. Let's take lions for example. Other than disease, lions are recognized as the biggest stumbling blocks to the recovery of African wild dog populations simply because they consistently go out of their way to kill them. Wolves in Russia's Seacoat Allen region are facing a similar situation, with Siberian tigers decimating their population. If wolves struggled to survive in areas dominated by lone tigers, it would be nearly impossible for them to thrive in an area populated by entire lion prides. Even without lions, there are still spotted hyenas to take into account. Both gray wolves and spotted hyenas actually once lived together in Europe and Asia during the last ice age. And pretty much every paleontological study indicates that hyenas not only fed on wolves, also suppressed their numbers in open plain areas. The only scenario in which gray wolves would actually survive in Africa would be for them to associate closely with human settlements, where they'd eat garbage and hybridize with feral dogs, such as is the case in Italy and Israel. Kangaroos are marsupials, which are an infra-class of mammals. Marsupials are unique in that they carry their underdeveloped young in an abdominal pouch. The babies are born after just a few weeks of gestation, 
and continue their development in the pouch until they are strong enough to emerge into the outside world. Kangaroos include four species that are mostly indigenous to Australia. These species are the red kangaroo, the antilopine kangaroo, the eastern grey kangaroo, and the western grey kangaroo. Another species of marsupial, the tree kangaroo, inhabits Papua New Guinea. Red kangaroos are the largest in the world. They typically grow over 5 feet, or 1.5 meters tall. Exceptionally, some can grow up to 6.9 feet, or 2.1 meters tall, and weigh as much as 200 pounds, that's 90 kilograms. They can hop on their strong, muscular hind legs, reaching speeds of up to 37 miles an hour. All kangaroos are strict herbivores and can be seen grazing grass, using their thick, powerful tails as a third back leg for balance. They have short forelimbs which can be used in their characteristic behavior of boxing and wrestling. They also balance solely on their tails whilst they deliver powerful kicks with their hind legs. Males often fight like this to gain access to receptive females and assert their dominance. Kangaroos can inflict serious injuries on people by boxing or kicking them. Attacks from kangaroos, however, are rare unless they are provoked. Whilst kangaroos are mostly endemic to Australia, here we ask the question, could they survive in Africa? To answer this question, we need to consider several factors. These include climate, habitat, and food that would be available to kangaroos in Africa as well as any potential competition or predators. So, firstly, let's look at the climate. Australia has a range of climates across its 3.3 million square mile land mass. In its center, Australia is a largely hot desert. In the north, mostly savanna, with oceanic and subtropical climates in the east, Mediterranean in the south, and cold desert and semi-arid regions throughout. There are plenty of countries in Africa that would offer a similar climate to Australia. In the north, countries like Algeria, Libya, and Egypt offer arid hot desert conditions, whilst more central countries like Congo and the DRC typically comprise tropical rainforests and savanna. More temperate climates are found in Africa's southern regions. With such varying climates, Africa offers a range of temperatures and levels of precipitation that are comparable to Australia. In an average year, the hottest country in Africa is Ethiopia, whilst the coolest is Lesotho, resulting in lush green rainforests, hot, dry deserts, and everything in between. Now, if we consider habitat, the different species of kangaroo live in different habitats, but they generally stay in areas where there is plentiful vegetation for them to eat. The red kangaroo is mostly found in the rangelands of western New South Wales and within arid and semi-arid regions. The western grey kangaroos live in forests, savanna, grassland, and shrubland. Eastern greys prefer areas with higher rainfall, with plenty of foliage and trees for cover, as well as open plains for feeding, and antilopine kangaroos frequent unwooded plains. Africa offers this kind of diversity, from the vast, open savannas and grasslands of South Africa, Botswana, Kenya, and Tanzania, to the forests and wetter regions found in Africa's eastern highlands, the Congo and Gabon. Kangaroos could survive in many of these habitats. Integrated with the kangaroo's habitat is their food. Considering the preferred food of kangaroos, we know that there would be an abundance across many parts of Africa, especially in the open plains and savannas. Kangaroos are strict herbivores and mostly graze grasses. The red kangaroo also browses various bushes and flowering plants. They graze Australia's open grasslands during the coolness of dusk or dawn or at nighttime. If we just look at the climate, habitat, and food available across Africa, it is likely that kangaroos could survive. But what about competition from other animals? And what about predators? Australia is home to more than 40 million kangaroos. If they were to inhabit Africa, there may be stiff competition with other herbivores. In Africa, these herbivores include a huge variety of different species, including antelope, wildebeest, zebras, rhinos, elephants, and hippos. 
With kangaroos grazing or browsing the African savannas and bush, they would occupy similar niches to Africa's native herbivores. Could Africa cope with yet another grazer on its open plains? Probably, but it may create pressure on those animals already found there. This could have a knock-on effect, as each organism, plant or animal, shuffles and readjusts to the changes that the introduction of kangaroos would cause. Furthermore, Australia doesn't have any large land predators. Of course, those in the water include crocodiles and many shark species, and Australia is home to some of the world's most venomous snakes, including 20 of the top 25. But its largest land predator is the dingo. This wild dog was introduced to Australia by Asian seafarers approximately 4,000 years ago, so technically it's not a native species. However, they are well cemented in the ecosystem. Dingoes hunt wallabies, wombats, birds, reptiles, and kangaroos. They can hunt in a pack, making them capable of taking down the large rad kangaroos as well. However, before the introduction of dingoes, there were few land predators that Australia's wildlife had to look out for. In southern Australia, there once lived a terrifying marsupial lion that became extinct around 30,000 years ago. They were carnivores weighing up to 290 pounds that had a bite force comparable to today's lions. These animals would have preyed upon kangaroos, especially the giant kangaroos that once roamed the Australian outback. But because Australia separated from the ancient landmass Gondwana 65 million years ago, Australia's wildlife was allowed to evolve into an incredible and often bizarre array of unique species, without influence from too many predators or invasive wildlife. These unique species include, but are not limited to, the duck-billed platypus, the echidna, the Tasmanian devil, the bandicoot, and, of course, the kangaroo. Australia's wildlife is incredibly vulnerable to invasive species due to its evolutionary isolation. For this reason, the Australian government is very strict about what enters the country. This suggests that some of Australia's species wouldn't fare too well in the great African wilderness, where there are predators aplenty. They may not have the evasive capabilities that some of Africa's native prey display. They would have to adapt to a new position in the food chain. Although they can travel up to speeds of 37 miles an hour and can kick with incredible force, kangaroos would likely be no match for Africa's apex predators. Lions, wild dogs, hyenas, cheetahs, and leopards could consider kangaroos prey. These predators hunt the herbivores found on the African plains and in the bush, the same kind of habitats that kangaroos would call home. Kangaroo populations, however, would likely remain stable, despite pressures from predation. A female kangaroo can support multiple babies all at different stages in their development. She can be pregnant with a fetus in the womb, have a second baby developing in her pouch, and be nursing an older baby on the ground. This means that their reproductive cycles are rapid, and females can mother many offspring in a lifetime. In Australia, kangaroos are considered pests. There are approximately twice as many kangaroos as people living in Australia. Because these marsupials graze grassland, farmers consider them competition for their grazing livestock. As far as their ecological impact goes, kangaroos are soft-footed, unlike the hardened hooves of sheep and cattle. As a result, they are less likely to trample vegetation and damage soil. Even so, their large numbers can lead to culls across Australia. Some are farmed for their meat, and with climate change and drier conditions becoming more common across Australia, they may prove to be a more suited agricultural animal than the less well-adapted sheep and cattle. What would the impact of kangaroos be on the African wilderness if they were introduced to the continent? Would they outcompete the other herbivores that call Africa home? Or would they live side by side with the likes of zebra, impala, blesbok, and kudu? There may be an abundance of habitat available to kangaroos across the African savannas, but each ecosystem on this planet is made up of a delicate balance of organisms. Any disruption in this balance could prove devastating. In conclusion, we believe that kangaroos would survive and thrive in Africa. Their adaptability to hot and arid climates and their herbivorous lifestyle would serve them well on the African plains. However, 
One question remains, would Africa survive the introduction of the kangaroo? Several lion subspecies are found in the wild. Two of them are the African lion and the Asiatic lion. When the two subspecies of Panthera leo are seen side by side, differences between them might be relatively minor, but appearances don't tell the whole story. Today, fewer than 30,000 African lions and only about 400 Asiatic lions are left in the wild. African lions once roamed most of Africa and parts of Asia and Europe, but the species has disappeared from 94% of its historic range and can only be found today in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. These lions mainly stick to the grasslands, scrub, or open woodlands where they can more easily hunt their prey, but they can live in most habitats aside from tropical rainforests and deserts. Asiatic lions once prowled from the Middle East to India. Now, only a fraction of these magnificent animals survive in the wild. The Gear Forest dry teak woods were once a royal hunting ground. Today, they are a reserve where these at-risk big cats are heavily protected. Asiatic lions are relatively smaller than their African lions, on average and in maximum figures. Adult males typically weigh between 353 or 420 pounds or 160 to 190 kilograms, while adult females weigh between 240 to 264 pounds, or 109 to 120 kilograms. The largest Asiatic lion on record measured 9.7 feet, or 2.9 meters from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. The male Asiatic lions have sparse and exceptionally short mane with their ears visible. Another standout mane feature is the color. The short mane is dark and less developed. Male African lions have a more prominent, fuller mane that covers the whole head and falls back over the shoulders. The mane signals how healthy a male is to females, which they use to attract them and intimidate other rivals. Other than the male's sparse mane, the most distinguishing characteristic of the Asiatic lion is a longitudinal fold of skin that runs along the belly. This trait is found in all Asiatic lions and very rarely in African lions. Interestingly, those from the West Central Africa region and the Barbary lions do have the same belly fold. Around 50% of Asiatic lions have what are called bifurcated infraorbital foramina. These are small holes in the skull that allow nerves and blood vessels to pass to the eye. If a lion's skull has two of these, it's an Asiatic lion. For whatever reason, African lions only have one infraorbital foramen. Their eyesight is just as strong as the Asiatic lions, so there's no particular benefit to having two infraorbital foramina versus just one. Lions are highly sociable and live in social units called prides. An Asiatic pride tends to be smaller than their African counterparts. The largest recorded Asiatic pride included five adult females but most just have two adult females. The reason behind this is that the Asiatic lions prey on smaller animals, which makes sense to have a smaller attacking force. Another possible reason is the size of their habitat. Gear National Park is not that big, and the hunting space is too constricted for the lions to operate in a large pride. In Africa, these prides include an average of four to six females, their cubs, and one to four male lions. The faster, more agile females do the hunting, while the larger male lions patrol and defend the pride's territory. The females in a pride usually give birth at the same time and raise their cubs together in a crash or nursery. Male Asiatic lions do not live in prides. In fact, they tend to only associate with female lions when mating or at large kills. Otherwise, they live alone or in a partnership with another male lion. These partnerships allow male Asiatic lions to control larger territories and more easily scare off rival males. In Africa, every lion pride has a resident male or group of males, which defend their prides vigorously against other males. Pride takeovers occur every two years, during which the suckling cubs of the defeated males are killed. This ensures that the new male will pass along his genes. So. Could Asiatic lions survive in Africa? The size and strength differences between African and Asian lions are minor, 
and the majority of this is due to habitat and food availability rather than genetics. That is why zoo Asiatic lions are larger than wild Asiatic lions in gear, because they are fed enough food and don't live in areas where trees get in the way. In addition, grassland Asiatic lions were larger than those found in forests like gear. The prey animals in the gear forest are generally smaller than those in Africa, so hunting groups tend to be smaller as well. This likely explains why pride size is so small. The most commonly taken prey species in the gear forest is the chittle deer, which weighs only around 110 pounds. These account for around 45% of known kills. The prey animals of the African savanna tend to be larger than those in the gear forest of northwest India. African lions will frequently tackle prey weighing as much as 600 to 800 pounds, such as a wildebeest and zebra and will occasionally take down African buffalo, which weigh between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds. This requires cooperative hunting techniques, which may explain why African lions live in larger prides. If wild Asiatic lions from gear were released into the savanna, they would probably survive. They are only around 15 kilograms smaller, and even though males live separately and females live in small groups in gear, that would not stop them from hunting wildebeest, kudu, and other medium-sized prey. Although it might hamper their ability to hunt large prey like Cape Buffalo, they may also change their behavior pattern and live in prides like African lions after a few generations. They could live in woodlands as well, which are similar to gear. However, adaptation in Africa would not be without its problems. They would probably have limited immunity to the diseases that are prevalent in the African continent. Even the more accustomed African lions frequently fall prey to epidemics. Another issue with adapting to the African continent is that they would most likely be unable to interbreed with African lions. The two subspecies are genetically rather different, and experiments in India to interbreed them resulted in very weak offspring. A small population of Asiatic lions introduced into a foreign country would likely face breeding challenges if they survive the droughts and diseases, and subsequent generations could become weak due to inbreeding. That said, if the introduction could be done in a carefully planned manner and their conditions monitored over time, some of these risks could be reduced and Asiatic lions could survive in Africa. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching. See you next time.